Hey, we are so excited. As Travis noted, we're starting this new series today. Go ahead and grab your Bible. I'll direct you there in just a moment. Hey, maybe you saw uh, many years ago now, it came out uh, a film, actually a series of films uh, that was called uh, The Pirates of the Caribbean. Maybe you saw that first one, The Curse of the Black Pearl, where in it, we learned that the bad guys, okay, the pirates, are a lot worse than we first think they are. Uh, because what happens, spoiler alert, I mean, it's been out for a while, but uh, what happens is when they step into the moonlight, then they become walking skeletons. You can see from uh, the moonlight coming in on them at night, what is on the inside is seen on the outside. And they are creepy and scary, essentially dead men walking. Now, you don't have to be, you know, a follower of, of Jesus. You don't have to be uh, really a, a spiritual person so much to know that it's true. Whatever's on the inside is going to come out on the outside, right? Whatever you think is ultimately going to come out of your mouth. But the Bible tells us that whatever's in the heart is what comes out ultimately, even out of the mouth. In fact, this morning, we're singing from our hearts to the Lord. Now, it's possible to sing, to worship him, just be singing songs, not really engaging with his spirit as worship is spirit and truth, right? Jesus put it this way in Matthew 12, 34, out of the overflow of the heart, the mouth will speak. He's saying whatever is in the heart is going to come out of the mouth. It's going to come out of your life. And so we're going to be thinking a lot in these days as we walk through this fall for the next 10 weeks, in fact. You know, there are nine. We're going to look at all of the fruit of the Spirit. Most of our Connect groups are walking through a series starting today on the Holy Spirit. We're really focused in on the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. And uh, probably no more uh, important time in my lifetime than, than right now for us as believers to live radically different lives. And it's going to happen when our hearts are transformed and so that what comes out of our mouths, what comes out of our lives is seen. So we're going to talk about living really from the inside out. Uh, in fact, you know, the Bible tells us that the fruit of the spirit, as we'll see today, the, the, and, and get this, uh, sorry, this is a pet peeve, my fruit, not fruits, though there are fruits, there are fruits, there are characters, uh, traits and characteristics of those who follow Jesus. It's the fruit. In other words, it's the produce, all right? It's the, it's the outgrowth. It's the result of the spirit of God working in someone's life. Now, we're calling these, we've said it's calling cards of faith. And our idea here is, you know, when you have a calling card, you got a business card, it tells, you, it tells you real quick what somebody does, right? What team they're on. How about that? Who they're affiliated with. This is my role. This is what I do. It reveals who I am. And in the same way, the fruit of the Spirit does that. So today, I'm going to give us an overview. But first, I want to see, here's, here's, where, here how, here's how we'll outline this today. First, we have a problem. Okay, uh, and then we, we, we do have a solution. We'll get to it. But I want to also see what does this look like? What does it look like to live out this kind of life in this cultural moment in particular today? So I want you to turn in your Bible. You can go ahead and turn to Galatians. I'll get you there in a moment. But uh, I want us to see that, that we do have a problem, first of all. Now, we all know this. We all sense it, right? We feel it. Not only in our own personal lives, uh, where we find ourselves saying things we don't want to say. We have attitudes towards people. If we're honest, uh, we, you know, we're not always kind to others. But in our day, in this particular, again, moment in our history, uh, we're seeing a polarization as I have not seen in my lifetime. You would think that a pandemic would actually draw us together. I guess in some ways it really has. I know it has our church family. But in other ways, we've seen our, our, our nation more divided. People run to these binaries of, of, of this or that and extremes to the point where we can hardly have dialogue anymore. And now we're really leaning hard into this election season. Now we're gonna not, not going to talk about politics every week. But during this season, this is a time where we can live our lives in a radically different way. But the first thing I want you to see is this. The problem is internal before it's external. The problem is internal. See, while the common play on modern wisdom today is to focus on the outside, God always focuses on the inside. In fact, Jesus speaks to this over and over again. He works from the inside 
out, not from the outside in, right? So religions and philosophies of the world say, hey, look, look, just clean up the outside and all will be well. And yet we continue to have the same challenges and problems in our personal relationships, in our families, in our homes, in, in relationships with others, extended family or friends. We certainly see it in our culture today. And if we're not careful, we're going to be more discipled by the world than we are the word of God. In fact, Jesus says this in Mark 7, 15. There is nothing outside a person that by going into him can defile him, but the things that come out of a person are what defile him. He's saying, again, he's saying the problem, here's the heart of the problem. The heart of the problem is the problem of the human heart. That's the problem. So we've got to look on the inside. In fact, friends, listen, we need to be reminded today and even if you're a follower of Jesus, you've received his grace, we have con we're in constant need of his grace. The Bible tells us in Jeremiah 17, 9, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Desperately wicked is what the Bible says. Who can understand it? Every single person has a wicked heart. And I know that we don't often look at ourselves that way, but, but we have a problem and the problem runs deep right to the core of who we are. But here's the next thing I want you to see. The solution must then be internal. If the problem is on the inside, then, then, then the solution has got to penetrate the heart. It's got to come all the way to our hearts. Again, working from the inside out. I think a lot of people try to live religious lives, but they've not been transformed on the inside. And that becomes not only a beatdown because it's impossible to live this kind of life we're talking about with the fruit of the Spirit being displayed apart from a transformed heart. And so there's no half-hearted cleaning here. We need a heart transplant is what we need. That's what the Bible tells us. And this happens when we receive by faith. And listen, you might be listening to me today and you, you wonder if you're a, a Christian or not, or, or, or I'd ask this question. Have you truly come to a point where you've asked Christ to, to forgive you of your sin? It's an act of faith. And this is what's so hard for us. We want to be in the driver's seat, right? We want it to be, what can I do? What do I bring to the table? Let me tell you what you bring to the table. The only thing you bring to the table regarding your salvation is your sin that makes it necessary. That is it. And if that sounds harsh to you, I'm telling you, let's look at the Bible. The Bible says we are wicked to the core and we need God to transform our hearts. And so if you've never received Christ... You need to know today, he died on the cross for your sin. How about this? First, he lived the perfect life for you because you couldn't. So he becomes our substitute, not just our good example, but our substitute of life. And on the cross, he dies a death so we don't have to. He's raised again so that we too can live this resurrected life. This resurrected life here and now looks like a life that displays the spirit, the fruit of the spirit. So, hey, go ahead and turn to Galatians 5, all right? Turn to Galatians 5. I'm going to settle in on really the key, the key passage for this whole series that our children, as Jay noted, all of us are going to be focused on. I want all of our kids, we learned a fun song yesterday out on the lawn. We're going to learn the fruit of the Spirit. Parents lead the way, right? Disciple our kids to know this. We want all of our children uh, to learn early on what it is to be kind and loving. That happens in the home. And you'll watch your kids grow up actually loving one another. I promise. Preschool, parents, all right, junior high, you know, of parents, junior high. They will grow up to love one another as you model that in the home, right? So the nine traits that we see here are in Galatians 5. I'll get there in just a moment. Let me continue to set this up. Nine different character traits, okay, or qualities, right? But the problem today... Uh, runs deep, and we've talked about how it's, it's on, on the inside. But here's what's happened. I'm seeing this among even believers. We've lost our influence in the world in so many ways. If you read much, as I do often and all the time, you know that the influence of believers in America, and even in the modern West, has really been in decline in major ways over the past several decades. Research tells us that with each successive generation, we're seeing a decline of those who are committed uh, to, to even being a part of a church. And so the research runs deep and it's constant. Church attendance is down 45%. Uh, it, it was from 45% in 1993 to just 
100% just prior to the pandemic. Many people are saying now post-pandemic, we're, seeing, we're going to see more and more people who've just decided, I'm out. And it's going to be a challenge as we come back. But here's the thing. A lot of the decline has happened just over the last decade. Just over the past decade, we've seen a major shift. We're seeing more and more uh, people not following after Christ. Now, we can get really, really discouraged by this. Or we can address the problem because the research tells us also why we have the problem. The problem is that we have diluted the gospel. The problem is we have allowed the church or the, the Christian life to be co-opted, okay, in many ways, and particularly in this season, by government. And, and, and co-opted by, by the worldly uh, stuff or powers of this world and for many if we're not careful, politics becomes our functional God rather than the kingdom of God to determine our beliefs and then ultimately our, our actions. We've got to be people who live radically different lives. And the way that we're going to be witnesses in the world, listen, is not simply because we're right. Like I've proven my point. I won the argument. And not loving. The mark of the believer the mark of the Christian is light and love. Love leads the way. And so what we're seeing here, it's really a response to the grace of God in my life, right? That's what this fruit is. You're going to see. It's grace. So love is grace in action. That's what it is. It's his grace now extended to others through me. And so we've got to lead with love because the distinguishing mark of a believer is love. We've gotten so, so um, polarized in our day that we, we can hardly have dialogue anymore. And, and yet Jesus teaches us a better way. Let me just say it this way. You know, one of the hardest things about being a pastor in these days, and I talk to my friends, and this is the case you can imagine, is that people look through a political lens instead of the lens of scripture. And, and so what happens to make my point uh, here's what happens. I, I speak about, or any pastor, you know, speaks about a compassion issue or a justice issue. Here's what happens. We, we enter into that. We start talking about it. People will interpret it often a filter through a political lens or political partisan talking points instead of the word of God. Think about it. Just a little act exercise, okay? Left or right, all right? Progressive or conservative? Democrat or Republican? Yes, I'm, I'm going there. Watch this. Uh, if I talk about compassion for the unborn, people, uh, he's go, oh, he's going right. as a Republican issue. He, there he goes. Or he's, he's talking about, how about compassion for, for immigrants? Oh, he's going left. There he's going. He's, he's a Democrat. Here we go. How about care for the poor? Or can I say it? Women. You know, Me Too movement. All those. He's going, he's going left. I think, I, I think he's going left. We start to see things through the political lens instead of scripture. Right? How about support of, of law and f law and order? Uh, or support of our veterans? He's going right. Okay, what about uh, a passion for justice and racial reconciliation? He's going left. I think he's liberal. You see how that plays out? Now, here's the problem. The problem comes when we first are discipled by a political view instead of by Jesus himself. Our allegiances are flipped. So here's what happens. Someone who might vote Democrat is going to say, hey, oh, they're talking about a compassion for the unborn. That's not my thing. That's a Republican thing. I, I don't speak out on that. Or a Republican to say, oh, he's talking about social issues and equity and social justice and racial reconciliation. That's, that's more of a liberal thing. I think that's kind of a Democrat. I don't, I don't speak out on that. You see what happens? How crazy is that? And let me ask you this. How crazy is it that some of us start to uh, protest or come against those who are against uh, racial inequality and, and injustice? People who are, who are protesting, those who are protesting Injustice in the world. Where does Jesus land? Listen, Jesus has spoken clearly about these things, and he has not stuttered. The word of God tells us that our allegiances are to the kingdom of God and to the king, Jesus, and not to political parties. Now, I, I say all that because we're, we're really entering to this season. Again, we're not going to talk about politics, and, and, and you know this. I'm not going to point us to one, one, one candidate or another. I mean, it kind of comes down to one or two. Can I say it? Jesus loves Donald Trump, loves him. Jesus loves Joe Biden. And what happens is we often then tag people who follow after one or the other. This is what's going to happen. You're going to be tempted to label people instead of coming at them first 
with love, right? We can just outgrace people in this season. Listen, our primary allegiance is to the kingdom of God. And we must stand differently because, look, we are not. The, the Jesus we, we, we confront in Scripture is the one that we worship. We're, we're not solely uh, focused on, on you know, our allegiance to a blue donkey or a red elephant, but to a crucified lamb. To, to, to Jesus, who is the Lion of Judah. He is our, our Savior. He is the one. So let me ask you, who is discipling you? Are you being discipled by Jesus primarily? And I'd say it this way. I've said it before. If you think Jesus hates the same people you hate, then you're following after some other Jesus, not the one in the Bible. Because he loves all people, and we can do the same. I'm not saying that truth doesn't matter. But here's a word for some of us. We need to put down our bias and pick up our Bible. And so during this time, we're going to think hard about what it is to live out the fruit of the Spirit. And I know, I know voting gets complicated. I get it. So it's kind of what, what things matter most to you in, in regard to the kingdom of God. What if our vote this year really is, how can I love and serve my neighbor with this ballot? That is what God has called us to do. Love God, love others. But instead of, of being uh, divided by partisan views, let us be united around kingdom priorities. Listen, if you're a guest, if you're, if you're watching in, you need to know this is the church that we, we have here. If you're looking for a church that says Jesus is king and we're not going to run down political lines, we're going to follow him and him alone. This is the church. We're united in Christ. And I praise God that that's the church that we are. We're confident in him and we, we find our confidence in him alone. Now, why do I say all this? Because some of us are more passionate about our particular views uh, than we are about the gospel. Well, how do I know that? We're quick to talk about this, this, and this, and this, and this, and not talk about Jesus, his blood shed on the cross, what he's done for us, how he changes our hearts, and how we can love others. In Colossians 3, I know I told you we're getting to Galatians 5, but Galatians 3 says this. Paul lays out a list of things that can create division in the body among people. And he says this, here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. I love that. He's saying, here's what he's saying. He's saying words like Jew, non-Jew, religious, irreligious, insider, outsider, rich, poor, free, slave. I could go on. Black, white, Hispanic, Asian, Democrat, Republican, outsider again, insider. He says those words mean nothing around here. Instead, we're focused on one thing. And notice his first word there is here. It's an interesting word. He doesn't use this often. He's saying, in other words, uh, right here, now, in our house, okay, in this family. You know, Stacy and I, as we raised our kids through the years, even when they were little, uh, we, we would say, I mean, there were certain, you know, no, no tolerance rule on unkind words in the house. Parents, this is a good word for you, especially if they're little Okay, I mean, it's good all the way through. But if they're really young, you start young and say, no, 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 not in our house, right? Not in this family. We don't talk like that. Sometimes dad needs to step in, right? Don't talk to mama like that. No, not here. You do that early on and your kids will learn. Here, things are different, right? And this is the way it is. Paul is saying, hey, as a church family or as Christians here, we are different. We interact with people in a different way. So we have a problem, but there is a solution. And the solution is the, the power of God at work in our hearts. We can make a difference. We can be light. We, and this is what I, why I'm encouraged. Light shines brightest in the darkness. We can step into that space and be radically different. So look at Galatians 5. I told you we'd get there. 22, verse 22. Paul has been saying, in fact, let me, yes, he's been talking about those things that are, we need to, you know, follow after these things. Uh, but here's what happens. Sin comes into our lives. If we're not led by the spirit, he lists all these things out there in verses kind of 18, 19, 20. All of this stuff is the result. And we see it in our world today. He says, those who do such things continually practice these things is what it is. Make it a practice. They don't enter the kingdom of God. But then he says, but and he, then he brings this contrast. This is what I want us to see. We are to live very different lives. This is how we do it. But the fruit of the Spirit, again, fruit of the Spirit is love, 
joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. He says, against such things, there is no law. I've been talking about the law early. He says, there's no law against this. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. I love that. We'll talk about that. If we live by the Spirit, if we're filled with the Spirit, when we receive Christ, we receive the Spirit. We keep in step with the Spirit. This is an ongoing thing. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. Because there's enough of that. See, and in this particular era in our nation's history, friends, we've got to live radically different lives. These are tangible signs. These are uh, the expressions of one who is maturing and growing in Christ. I want to ask you, are you more loving today than you were yesterday? More loving today than you were a year ago? Or are you going the other way? Because here, this, this is really a test in the end. This can be a test for us. Look at what it says in, in 1 John. It says, if anyone says, I love God and hates his brother, he's a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has sent, seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. He's saying, hey, it, it, you can say one thing, but if your actions don't reveal that, then you're, you're lying to yourself. See how wicked the heart is? You're deceiving yourself. And so here's what I want to do. Uh, we're going to walk through each week. We're going to look at different fruit. And my hope is this. As we focus on a fruit okay, that, that corresponds with one of the fruit of the Spirit, then every time you see the fruit, okay, so families, you can do this with your kids. Every time you see the fruit, you'll remember what that fruit represents, right? And so the first one I want us to see, I've got my watermelon back here. Now, whenever you see a watermelon, I want you to think of love. That's the first one. And it's first because it drives all the other. Love is grace in action. That's what it is. And so, so, so you remember this, the, 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 the watermelon is the largest of them all, right? The watermelon is giant. In fact, what's crazy is a little teeny seed becomes this giant watermelon, which is 92%, by the way, water. So it's very, uh, I guess, nutritious, but it's, it's hydrating. It's why uh, we, we eat it a lot in the summertime, right? And many of you have, have, have great memories around watermelon, drawing the family together, maybe uh, 4th of July on a hot summer day, or maybe at the lake or poolside or somewhere. The, the watermelon can remind us, it's a great analogy, of how things can start out small. A small act of love and kindness can lead to great things. It's an analogy of the kingdom, right? Okay, so joy is the next one. Joy is grace on display, all right? So I've chosen the, the orange is going to be uh, grace on display. Now, the orange, if I were to bust this orange open or cut it open, you, you've probably been there. If somebody's done that, you know, you got to step back, right? It could splash all over you. Uh, that's the way joy is. Joy is contagious. Joy is, I mean, who doesn't like orange, right? And drink orange juice like the nectar of the gods is what that is. But it'll splash all over you. It's like us splashing Jesus, right? Just overflowing with Jesus, splashing Jesus. Jesus on others is joy. That's love, grace on display. All right. The next one is peach. Peach. Uh, I chose peach because in English, at least, it's just one letter different. Sounds like peace. So it's peace. Peace. And here's why. Peace. Uh, you know that the peach oh, it feels so good. The peach has this downy kind of soft, though thin skin on it. But the peach, see, whatever comes its way, I don't know if you know this, like, a, like water hits it. The weather comes at it and it just bounces right off. You also know there's a rock inside, right? It's hard from the inside out. It's rock solid on the inside. Peace is not shaken by outward circumstances. So whenever you see a peach or eat a peach, you can remember the peace of God that guides us, right? The next one is patience. Patience. I wonder which one you might think it is. Patience is grace in waiting. I chose the, the pineapple. Man, I love pineapples. I don't, frankly, like a lot of fruit. I could eat all this. But uh, one of my favorites is the pineapple. Here's the thing about the pineapple. You got to have patience. It, it takes like a couple years to grow, two, even three years to grow a pineapple, okay, unlike other fruit. And it takes some patience to get to it. It's hard to get to it. But once you do, it is worth it, right? And so when you look at a pineapple, often a symbol of welcome, uh, let it remind you of patience and consider those in your life. Because the patience of God, it, it draws people to him. But when you get to that, man, it's worth the wait. 
You honor God through your patience. The next one's kindness. Kindness, I chose the grape, okay? The grape. The good grape is small. Uh, grapes are small, but they, they come in bunches. How about that? Kindness comes in small ways, and it can come in bunches. In fact, that's really the way we display the Spirit, probably more than anything. And this is the radical move on our part in these days, that we could come before God and with small acts of kindness... We, uh, we come and serve other people. And so that's going to be kindness. Remember that. Grace in the small stuff. Grapes come in uh, like 5,000 varieties. Lots of ways to show kindness. The next one is goodness. What do you think? Goodness to the core is the apple. The apple is so good for you. There's 2,500 varieties of them. How about that? In the U.S. alone, 7,500 different kinds of apples in the world. Uh, they're, they're good for you, right? They're, so, they're cholesterol free. They're, they, you, apple a day keeps the doctor away. They're good to the core. All right. So remember that as you eat apples. Faithfulness is grace to the end, and I chose banana. Now, the banana, here's why. The banana is the most eaten tropical fruit in the world. Uh, it's been said that if you eat a banana a day, you'll have everything that you need. It, in fact, the, it, it has eight amino acids that your body can't produce on its own. How about that? The, the, the banana is, is, is faithful not only as you eat it, but it's faithful anywhere you eat a banana in the world. Anywhere a banana tastes the same, right? And it actually comes wrapped, like a little wrapping. I mean, amazing. So faithfulness, you can remember the banana. Gentleness is grace in response. I chose the avocado. The avocado, uh, you know, here in Texas, I guess, is going to probably be guacamole perhaps for you. But the, the avocado is, is, is like, like a pear. It has this pear-shaped, uh, it's kind of tear-shaped. Uh, but, but, the, but the gentleness of the avocado, I don't know how to shop much for produce, frankly, but I know how to shop for an avocado. You can find it like this one. It's just soft enough, not too soft, but it's got to be ripe enough so that when you, you touch it, you can squeeze it just a little bit, take it home and make some guacamole. I say that because the gentle touch is what's needed for all people around us. And we can provide that gentle touch so be reminded of, of the gentleness, grace in response. And then finally, self-control is grace in command. When someone is in command of their heart, guided by the Spirit of God, they practice self-control. I, uh, I chose the strawberry for that one because if you like strawberries, you can't, you can't just eat one, right? If there's more than one, you're going in again. And so you've got to practice self-control when you've got the, the strawberry around. So we're going to talk about these as we walk through the season. Even today, maybe you're going to find yourself seeing a fruit and you can be reminded, teaching your kids, talk about it as you go along the way, right? But here's the thing I want you to see. Every one of these, uh, these seeds, every one of them, uh, or, or uh, fruit, started as a seed. So I can barely grab this. You can't even see this. I've got a watermelon seed right here on the tip of my finger. Can you imagine this? Think about this. This seed now, out of the watermelon, you take it away. You, you, you set it aside long enough. It, it's, I mean, it's dead. It's dead, right? You've got a, you could have a plant growing. You have a fruit growing. The seed is dead. The seed comes out of the plant. You put it in the ground. You, you put it in the soil. You water it. God does the rest of that. And then look what happens. This little teeny seed becomes this giant watermelon or this beautiful banana tree or beautiful strawberries, whatever they are. Look, Jesus put it this way. He said it this way in, in John 12, 24. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a grain of wheat falls to the earth and dies, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. He's saying, look, you can take a seed and toss it aside and it, it is dead. But if you bury it, if you put it, in, if you allow God to do the work inside, right from the inside out, it becomes something glorious and beautiful. Think about that. Only God can do that. So a natural law becomes a spiritual law. This is what Jesus is saying. You've got to die to yourself. In fact, he said it literally, Luke 9, 23. And he said to, said to them all, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. Friend, I don't want to ask you, have you, have you truly given your heart to Jesus? Have you died to yourself? Because here's what, here's what we see. Paul, this itinerant preacher, I, I could say this traveling artist who paints pictures with words. He paints a portrait here of Jesus. Galatians 
5, 22, 23 explains and shows us a picture of Jesus. Look, we have a problem, but there is a solution. And his name is Jesus. And if you've not received his grace, friend, I just want to encourage you, today is your day. Today's the day. I want to say this. On Friday, we had, uh, I'll close with this. We had, a, uh, we had a service here. We had a memorial service for Leslie Lynn. Some of you may know Greg and their daughters, Dana and Hannah, their families uh, in our church. But Leslie um, passed away after, um, you know, we always talk about a courageous battle with cancer. I'm talking about faithful, spiritually uh, glorifying the Lord Jesus throughout is what I'm talking about, throughout her illness. She gave a gift to the family that I was able to read. It was really a, a book, essentially. It's kind of a memoir that she wrote about her life. And it was just incredible. She, in it, she had some favorite Bible verses, songs, so powerful. And among her favorite verses was this one. She, she writes this in Psalm 27, verse 13. I am confident of this. I shall yet see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. And then she, she writes this. Listen to her own words. When I waited for results at MD Anderson through the years, I often reminded myself of this verse, the first half, and it brought me singular peace. When my diagnosis was given, I believe it was the first thing I uttered. And I stand on it to this very moment. The entire verse, including the second half, I often used in personal prayer as it reiterates both my faith and acceptance of God's good plan and, and, and attests to the restored relationship I now have through Christ's atonement that permits me to boldly bring my request to him. Friends, listen, I know this. I know that now Leslie stands before the presence of God and she is seeing the goodness of God face to face. And I just want to challenge you with this as we close. Do you, do you know that you know for certain that you have received Christ's grace? Because listen, you're not going to get there on your own, friend. Your heart is wicked to the core. God is holy. We're separated from him. And if you want to stand before him, even today, forgiven, totally forgiven, you can pray this prayer with me. And if you know others who need to know the Lord Jesus, tell them. Please tell them there's a sense of urgency in these days, friends. But I want us to pray together as we close. And then we're going to sing a song that actually reflects, reflects our great hope today. So pray with me now. Friend, if you've never received Christ or you're not certain, you can, you can be certain today. Say, Lord Jesus, thank you for dying on the cross for my sin. I give you my life. By faith, I give you my life. And now make me the person you've created me to be. For all of us, let us join in this prayer. Lord, we want to be more like Jesus. We don't want to go the way of the world. We don't want to be bitter. We don't want to be unkind. We want to be loving. We want to see grace on display in our lives. We want to be more like Jesus. So we give you our lives. We proclaim it today. We sing it out to live it. In Jesus' name we pray.